Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on Breeding for Nutrition in Organic Seed Systems. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many recorded webinars on organic farming topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. This webinar is a rebroadcast of a presentation given at the Organic Seed Growers Conference in Port Townsend, Washington this past January. There are several live broadcasts that we recorded at the conference that can be found at extension.org slash pages slash 61925, but I'll be typing that link into your chat box in just a moment so you know where to find those presentations. Um, before we begin, I'd like to pass these things o this over to Michaela Colley, who will be moderating the presentation, and she's going to introduce the speakers. Good morning, everyone. This is Michaela from the Organic Seed Alliance. Uh, we have three presenters this morning, uh, the first of which is Philip Simon. He's a USDA Agricultural Research Service geneticist and a professor of horticulture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research on carrot and garlic genetics and breeding is conducted to improve these crops for growers and consumers. Some of his key areas of interest include carrot and garlic genetics and the development of genomic tools and genetic improvement of carrot root knot nematode resistance, crop diversity and origins, and the nutritional quality and flavor of both carrots and garlic. Philip is also the uh, PI on a new project called the Carrot Improvement for Organic Agriculture. Alice will give you the URL for that website uh, at the end of this talk. Jim Myers will be the second speaker. Jim Myers holds the Bagot Fraser Endowed Chair of Vegetable Breeding and Genetics in the Department of Horticulture at Oregon State University. He works on a number of crops including dry and snap beans, edible potted pea, broccoli, tomato, winter and summer squash, and sweet corn. His main interest has been to improve vegetable varieties for disease resistance and human nutrition while maintaining quality and productivity in improved varieties. Jim is also breeding tomatoes, broccoli, and summer squash for organic systems. His latest variety release is the high anthocyanin tomato indigo rose. The third presenter is Walter Goldstein. Walter Goldstein grew up and received his education in Washington State, but now lives in Wisconsin. He has bred corn under organic conditions since 1989. He was the research director at Michael Fields Agricultural Institute for 25 years. He has recently begun a research and education organization called the Mandeman Institute for breeding nutritionally valuable crops and promoting healthy farming practices. The speakers will be giving their presentations for about an hour and then we'll have half an hour for questions and answers. What I want to talk to you today about is an example of a horticultural crop that um, already is pretty nutrient dense, but we've, I guess, added value to the crop, and that's and that's tomato. Um, what I what we have worked with this is something that Phil didn't spend a lot of time talking about, where the the phenolics and flavonoids, and um, these are compounds that I guess aren't essential for uh, humans in the diet, but they they do have um, they, they've been shown to have various health benefits. But there are two basic classes of these compounds: the phenolics and the flavonoids. Uh, we've focused on the flavonoids and, in particular, anthocyanins. Um, but they're they, you know they have a lot of similarities um, with uh, in structure and in biological activity. The phenolics tend to be um, more simple in structure, but also have similar biological activity. And uh, one of the things we've often we've found in our work is that by increasing levels of things like anthocyanins, uh, we often increase the level of phenolics as well. Um, okay, so th these compounds have um, various biological activities. Um, they're pigments that we often see, especially the anthocyanins. Like um, there's a, a picture of a a, uh, an eggplant flower and a radicchio head and then a, a corn, a field corn uh, with um, anthocyanin pigments. Um, the flavanols are uh, a good example of that is the, uh, the yellow onion. Um, they're kind of yellow and brown pigments. Um, 
the uh, health benefits that people have um, identified are things like anti-allergenic ability, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, anti-carcinogenic, and, and antioxidant. That's a term you hear quite a bit nowadays. Um, I always have to add a caveat here in that we really aren't exactly sure how flavonoids work in the human body. They don't appear to be antioxidants directly, but may act through other antioxidant systems. Um, some of the possible health benefits have been uh, anti-carcinogenic properties and then the improved cardiovascular function. This is related, I think, to the anti-inflammatory abilities. So why work with potato, or tomatoes in particular? It is um, second in per capita consumption among vegetables after potatoes. Um, Phil has already shown some of the nutritional advantages or benefits to tomatoes and with the carotenoids um, and, and, and vitamin C. Um, carotenoids, by the way, are uh, lipophilic compounds. They're, you find them in the, the fatty fraction, um, whereas the, the flavonoids and anthocyanins are, are in the water-soluble fraction. So there's a complementary aspect to working with these two phytonutrients. So how can we go about increasing this? Um, tomatoes in general are relatively low in flavonoids in the fruit. Um, and, um, and generally they're absent in, uh, the anthocyanins are absent in these kinds of fruits. Um, two approaches, one is transgenic. As there's been some work uh, done of this sort where um, various genes have been introduced in tomato that um, upregulate um, anthocyanin production. An example of that is shown in the, the picture up, uh, the upper picture. And um, the, the approach that we've taken has been to use genes that come from wild species. And here is an example of a wild species, Solanum peruvianum, which has um, purple anthocyanins in the fruit here. This is a green-fruited uh, species that um, unlike tomato, does not uh, develop red fruit. They remain, remain green when they're entirely ripe. And um, the, this happens in several uh, tomato relatives, and several of those genes have been introduced into tomato. Tomatoes have an excellent, excellent uh, set of genetic resources. There's a genetic stocks collection where there are many of these genes available, and that's what we've, we've done is um, request these uh, sources of these materials from the, the collection and work with these. Um, there's a lot of wild species uh, available. And the other thing that's very nice is that, that there's a lot of literature in tomato on fruit development. That's pretty handy. So here in a nutshell is um, the uh, genetic material that we've been working with. You know, see uh, gene symbols here, at ATV stands for atavialasium. Um, these represent two accessions carrying that particular trait. This comes out of um, uh, Solanum cheesmanii from the Galapagos Islands and some work that uh, Charlie Rick did a number of years ago. ABG stands for aubergine, uh, and this is a, uh, a gene that comes out of Solanum lycopersicoides. And then anthocyanin fruit is one that comes uh, out of uh, Solanum chilensi. And notice that there are varying degrees of uh, anthocyanin in these. In the ATV types, you can't even see the anthocyanin, although if you put it, if you look at these with a, a magnifying lens, you'll see individual cells on the, the epidermis that have anthocyanin in them, whereas there's better expression in ABG and AFT. We've not worked as much with ABG because it um, uh, seems to be unstable and we can't fix it in the fruit. So primarily our work has been done with AFT. And um, what we learned was that we can dramatically increase the expression of anthocyanin by combining ATV with either AFT or ABG. And that's this fruit you see down here in the center. Um, it's, a, it's a double mutant. Um, AFT is a dominant, um, ATV is a recessive, 
So you have to um, do a little bit of, of, of uh, selection work to get the two of them uh, together. One of the, the characteristics of ATV is this purple foliage that you see in the, the fruit or the, in the plants uh, in this picture here. And that ha that's, a, that's a nice selectable marker. You can combine that with selecting for the really intense pigmentation um, such as see, you see in the fruit here. Notice that um, when the fruit is green, you tend to get more of a bluish cast to it. Once it ripens, then it becomes more of a brownish um, purple. One of the questions we often get is, okay, what's the big deal? Um, you know, there are a lot of purple and black heirloom tomatoes out there, um, purple Cherokee, black cream, and so forth. Well, those are a completely different uh, genetic system. And uh, it's, it's basically the green flesh gene, which prevents a uh, complete breakdown of chlorophyll, produces a brown pigment called pheophyton. And that combined with the, um, the red from the lycopene gives you this kind of motor oil type color in the, on the, in the epidermis and then in, in the interior. So it doesn't have anything to do with anthocyanins. So some of the characteristics of these um, high anthocyanin fruits, um, one is that the expression is only in the epidermis, so the interior remains uh, showing the red of the the, uh, the lycopene. Um, another thing is that this uh, pigment is uh, UV sensitive so that um, the pigment develops as fruit are exposed to light. And um, you can see in this panel here of a fruit that were picked off the plant and then allowed to sit for up to uh, 190 hours. If, there, if this was done in the dark, there was no change in pigmentation, but in the, the um, under UV light, then pigment uh, increased in these. So, um, one of the things we found when we were breeding this material is that we were inadvertently selecting for more, more open plant canopies when we selected for the most intensely pigmented types as well, uh, which stands to reason. So um, to quantify the amounts of uh, these compounds in here, the, we're, these, this table shows um, uh, gallic acid equivalents, which is a measure of, of total uh, phenolics and, and flavonoids. And then we have another set of columns that shows anthocyanins. You can see in our normal tomatoes legend and um, a, a line in accession is carrying um, the gene R. You can see that there are about 35, 36 um, milligrams per gram fresh weight of phenolics. No anthocyanins present. When we um, add the anthocyanin genes, we see a dramatic increase in uh, total phenolics. And we also see the presence of anthocyanins in these materials. And in small fruited types, this can be up to 459 uh, milligrams per gram fresh weight. So, We've also looked at antioxidant capacity of, of these materials, and you can see that um, uh, we have the four different accessions here, and then you re we've used or ORAC, we have the Trolox equivalents. Um, and we, in these uh, anthocyanin types, the, uh, the Trolox equivalents range from about 900 up to over 2,000. And, um, these, what's, what's interesting to me is, I, I don't have the data shown here, but we've also looked at carotenoids, and there are maybe a tenth of the uh, antioxidant potential of the anthocyanins in the, these materials. So another thing that we've looked at is um, what happens if you manipulate the pathway. This is a, uh, you know, the pathway for the production of uh, flavanols and then ultimately um, anthocyanins, and they're, they're a, a branch of the um, of this uh, for, branching off from the Naranjan chalcone uh, molecule, and um, this is where we think AFT and ATV act. And these seem to be regulatory genes that regulate the um, uh, enzyme that 
produces anthocyanins. But you can block this pathway, and what you see happening is, then is that uh, compound. What should happen is that we should see an increase in the, in the accumulation of flavanols like kempferol and quercetin, those yellow-brown pigments. And we were able to do this by uh, taking additional mutants from the genetic stocks. There's anth anthocyanin absent and anthocyanin without, and we produce these uh, triple mutant lines. And um, in this picture on the left, you see the anthocyanin fruit uh, type showing the anthocyanin present. And then um, when we add the uh, anthocyanin without, then we, we don't see the pigment as strongly. In the AFT ATV type, we do see a little bit of pigment expression, which was something surprising to us. Um, and when we measure these, they, they do have very high levels of phenolics. Here is uh, the other thing is that in these types with, that are producing a little bit of anthocyanin, it appears to be a different form. Um, and that when we acidify it, it become, we see a much redder color. We don't know exactly what form it is at this point. So when we, um, we look at total uh, phenolics here, and we're looking at uh, chemferol, quercetin, and rutin, and you see the, um, the P20-3 is uh, um, the anthocyanin line. P172 are two uh, selections from this anthocyanin without. Uh, we see that we have um, increased levels of these various uh, flavanol compounds. One of the more intriguing aspects of these uh, the high anthocyanin types has been that they seem to be more re resistant to fruit decay. And you, if you remember back in the beginning, I said one of the properties of these of anthocyanins is antimicrobial activity. So maybe it's not too surprising. But we discovered this because we were taking pictures of uh, our tomatoes out on the in the field and just leaving them to lay there. And so this is a picture that's coming back 35 days after we took the initial picture. And you can see that the, the yellow-fruited line has um, pretty much rotted, whereas the anthocyanin pigmented line is uh, still very much intact. Um, there's still a lot more genetic variation to, to investigate. Uh, we've started doing this by looking at the uh, Solanum lycopersicum seraciformi core collection, and we've documented some of the variation in phenolics in this material. And um, I think this could be combined then with some of these anthocyanin genes that we've characterized and boost the levels to, to higher uh, and greater quantities. So I would um, finish my talk there, just an acknowledgment of various people who have worked on the project with uh, three graduate students and a number of other individuals who supported this work. So thank you very much. <laughs>